Hey, thanks everyone. I want to first say thank you to Jeffrey and Nicole and everyone in TransTech. It's a really awesome conference, unlike anything else, and it's really special, so thank you. Uh, today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the vagus nerve. Uh, it's this really awesome nerve bundle that uh, transverses your entire body through your entire torso, targets all of these different smooth muscle organs in your body, and is involved in a lot of things in day-to-day -day life. You can actually stimulate this nerve to have a lot of therapeutic and uh, health and wellness benefits. So uh, let's just go ahead and start here. These are my disclosures. Uh, Body Neurotech is a startup out of Charleston that commercializes some of the TDCS uh, findings we did in the lab. Over the last few years, I'm a consultant at Equility that's developing really cool uh, non-invasive VNS tech, and I have some IP and some of the other um, technologies. So a little bit about my research overview. Uh, my research really focuses on four different uh, modalities with four different domains. So the first one really is neurorehabilitation, using brain stimulation to enhance and augment your recovery from things like stroke or traumatic brain injuries. Another one is neuropsychiatric treatments. The most common one you guys probably know about is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's the most common FDA-approved uh, non-pharmacological intervention for de major depressive disorder. We do stimulation fMRI, where we combine both uh, brain stimulation in the fMRI scanner to look at what happens in the brain as a response to these stimulation paradigms. This is a picture uh, setting up TMS uh, in the fMRI scanner here at Stanford CNI. Um, and then we also do uh, e-meditation. My lab developed e-meditation in 2015. It's a way to enhance and accelerate meditative practice using transcranial direct current stimulation, which is really the smallest electrical current and safest form of brain stimulation that we use. And it all begins here. Really, the brain is an electrochemical organ. You can fire neurons or activate nerves in one of two ways. You can use a chemical or a pharmacological agent to uh, bind to receptors on the neuron, which cause it to fire. And this firing, uh, whoop, let's go back. This firing causes an influx of calcium and releases neurotransmitters that then bind on the postsynaptic membrane of the next neuron and then cause a depolarization in the next neuron. But you can also use electricity to circumvent this process and induce an action potential without any ligands binding. And that's really the, the premise behind neuromodulation. There's many forms of neuromodulation, and they all involve energy uh, being delivered to the brain um, in a variety of either pulse patterns or tonically. So the two most common ones are on the left. I like to say the most common ones are here on the left, and the kind of weird ones are on the right. So uh, the most common ones are transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is an electromagnetic coil that's placed on the scalp. Usually they come in figure eight orientations. They're really copper windings that deliver electricity um, through them. And then they cause a magnetic pulse that can fire neurons. It's really powerful. It treats uh, depression and a variety of other neuropsychiatric disorders. Today we'll be talking about electrical stimulation. The most common is vagus nerve stimulation, uh, but there's also other forms of TES, so transcranial electrical stimulation. They're really mild in effect and really safe. They're being used in an at-home consumer space as well. Uh, we have ultrasound, electromagnetic radi radiation, physical pressure, and meditation and yoga are also forms of um, internal uh, neuromodulation. So this is the vagus nerve on the left. Is a, a drawing made by an artist in the 1500s in Italy that describes essentially all the nerves that are in your body, with the main one here being the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, vagus is Latin for wandering, and that's kind of the title of the talk. It wanders throughout your body and targets all of these different uh, bodily organs that are in your body, and it's responsible for the day-to-day -day relaxation and slowing of these systems. It's really known as the parasympathetic nervous system modulator. And on the right, you can see a cross-section of the vagus nerve. So if you take the vagus nerve, you cross it, uh, you can see that it's really a bundle of 100,000 individual nerves. Some of them are myelinated, some of them are not, and they're located within sheaths. So it's really hard to discern what part of the nerve targets what organ, but this entire bundle works in synchrony to modulate all of these organs. Now, on uh, the right is uh, a dear friend of mine, Jake Zabara, who's the inventor of vagus nerve stimulation. He invented it in the 80s, um, and then in 1997 in Philadelphia uh, was the first uh, patient that was implanted with a vagal nerve stimulator. Uh, 
He's actually 87 now, and he still runs marathons. So if you're trying to work out for your New Year's resolution, remember that Jake still runs marathons at 87. It's impressive. Um, and this is what VNS looks like. Classically, we implant an implantable pulse generator, an IPG or a CAN, uh, is what we call it. Underneath the clavicle, we wrap electrodes around uh, the left cervical bundle of the vagus nerve and deliver electricity, electricity tonically until pretty much the battery runs out after five years, after which we replace the battery and you keep going. The pros are that it treats intractable epilepsy really well. For people that have failed all the different interventions for epilepsy, you can implant a, a VNS stimulator and you have about a 40% likelihood of minimizing the seizures by 50%. You also can now treat depression and chronic morbid obesity with VNS, but there's some cons. One is it's expensive. Two, you have to do, go under a knife and get a surgery. Uh, three, it's not always covered by insurance or Medicare. Uh, if there's complications or the battery dies, you have to get a new implant. That's costly. So if you really have failed everything and you want to get an implant, it costs about $50,000. But here's the data. So a good friend, old friend of mine, Harold Sackheim, uh, ran a bunch of studies looking at VNS reduction of epilepsy and depression. And you can see that at about a year out, 20% uh, of patients implanted with a vagal nerve stimulator have over 75% reduction in their epileptic seizures, with uh, their Hamilton depression rating scores also decreasing by about 75%. So it's really effective. The hard part is the response rate's pretty low. And secondly, you can't really predict who's going to respond and who's not. So it's kind of a blind method that improves over time, but still uh, could be better. Now, there's a lot of really promising animal literature that shows these really amazing uh, effects of VNS in different animal, animal models. So on the left, you have these really cute, uh, good again, uh, potbelly pigs. And they like to eat a lot, and they like to gain a lot of weight. Um, so what you do is you implant two vagus nerve stimulators on their vagus nerve at the level of their stomach, and you let them go ahead and eat whatever they want, as normal. So some of them got the real stimulation, some of them just got implanted and it never got turned on. The pigs don't know the difference. And the ones that got the real stimulation, you could see uh, their body weight plateaus, whereas the other sham stimulation, the, the, peop the pigs that were implanted and never turned on actually kept gaining weight. So this is recently FDA approved now in humans after a series of really promising clinical trials. And on the right, it's hard to see because it's a little dark, but you can see that um, in a rat model, if you induce a stroke with collagenase and turn on vagus nerve stimulation right after you induce the stroke, you rescue parts of the brain that end up being damaged from the stroke. So you could see uh, up here is a, is a rat that got a stroke induced, but no stimulation, same type of rat, stroke-induced, with stimulation on right after, and you rescue about 75% of the cortex. The same thing in the experimental group, too. So there, you can go ahead and look up all of these promising animal models, but it's hard to translate what happens in animals to humans because of all the cons of VNS. It's hard to get all the money and go to the hospital and get the team and Im implant 50 people and look at an exploratory finding. So what we need to do is we need to do something that's non-invasive, but there's also even more really promising stuff to, uh, to look at, and it's this idea that perhaps stimulation alone doesn't do much, right? So on the left, there's this idea that you can give a stimulation or a stimulus independently, and you slowly get response rates that are modest at best. But if you pair the experience, such as rehabilitation training in occupational therapist setting, or you do it with cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy to treat mood disorders, and you pair it with the bursts of neuromodulators in the mode of VNS, then you get this idea of targeted plasticity. So you get this kind of generalized uh, opening of this plastic mechanism in the brain that otherwise slowly is going away as we get older. So it's this almost like a skeleton key to unlock the brain's neuroplastic mechanisms. You could see this uh, exemplified best in an animal model um, in a motor system where we can implant electrodes in the motor system and then look at the cortical activation of different parts of the motor system representing different body parts of the animal. So here you have a naive rat, and you record the electrical activity on the cortex, and you can see different parts of the motor cortex represent different parts of the body, like the distal forelimb, the primary, primary forelimb, and so on. 
when you do training paired with stimulation, you get growing of the motor cortex area associated with that type of training, such as the distal forelimb or the hind legs. So this stuff doesn't happen without stimulation. This is all placebo controlled. So if you don't do stimulation, you don't get the growing and reorganization of the motor cortex. So it's really promising as a plasticity inducer. Now, what my research has been doing at MUSC for the last five years is developing non-invasive VNS, which targets the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which innervates bilaterally in the ear. So on the left, you can see the really complex nerve innervation in the ear. Your ear is not just used for listening, but really is a sensory organ as well. You can send information to your brain through your ear. So you can circumvent the implant by stimulating these nerves. These are all the different targets that you can stimulate. The most biologically active uh, vagal afferent networks can be accessed through the tragus, the external auditory canal, the concha, and the symbaconcha. So this entire area in green is a prime target for non-invasive stimulation, and that's what we've been doing. So when you develop new paradigms like this, you have to optimize it. So you try a bunch of different parameters in a bunch of healthy people to determine what happens when you stimulate. These started in 2013, and recently they were published last year in a series of experiments where we tested auricular vagus nerve stimulation's effect on heart rate, heart rate variability, and perceived feelings of calm. So you can see that there's specific parametric effects that occur where when you turn stimulation on, depending on the parameter, you get a decrease in heart rate pretty quickly. You also not, not mentioned here is this increase in heart rate variability that, that increases, you could find it in the paper. And when you turn stimulation off, there's this huge sympathetic response that happens after you turn it off. So there's this homeostatic innervation that happens in the body, and we're pushing it one way, and then we're, when we turn stimulation off, it rebounds the other. So this is parasympathetic, this is sympathetic. It's really one of the first uh, biomarker descriptions of auricular vagus nerve stimulation in the literature. And this was exciting, but we wanted to find out, are we actually getting into the brain, or is this just kind of a systemic downstream effect only? So what we did was we built this really cool non-invasive VNS stimulator that can go in the scanner. So to put things in the fMRI scanner, they need to be non-ferromagnetic, so made out of plastic, copper, silver. Um, and then you have to do this complex system where you trigger um, stimulation from outside the scanner room, because the MRI is this huge magnetic field that'll suck in any metal uh, into its bore if it's within like 20 feet. So what we do is we run a lot of long cables through the roof, uh, through the ceiling of the scan room, and we trigger stimulation from outside the, in the equipment room, and we connect stimulation in the bore of the scanner to an individual. So this PVC pipe is acting as an insulator. This individual here has uh, electrodes on their ear, and then we put them in the scanner and we look at what their brain looks like. But we don't only look at what happens in the active condition, we look at what happens in the control condition. The control condition, if we go back here, you can see that this part of the ear, the earlobe, doesn't have much green in it, which means there's not a lot of auricular branch innervation. So that's used as our control site for all studies. And what we see here is when you turn on stimulation on just the earlobe, you get contralateral somatosensory activation. You stimulate the ear a little bit, the brain thinks it's a little tickle on the ear, and that's it. But when you turn on active stimulation, which is just a couple centimeters away from the placebo stimulation site, it's a little hard to see here, but you get this afferent vagal network that lights up. And what you could do is you could take the contrast. So you take active stimulation of the ear, you remove sham stimulation, and you get the overall effect of what ear stimulation is like on the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. And you see areas like the anterior cingulate, the cerebellum, the left prefrontal cortex all light up. All of this mimics all of the early cervically implanted VNS fMRI studies that were published in the 90s. So we have developed this way to push and pull the parasympathetic nervous system on heart rate, but we have a really effective central nervous system modulator in the brain, which opens up a variety of different neuropsychiatric disorder treatments that you can treat with VNS, and you can also pair VNS with different behavioral interventions, and it should work. And so far, all of the early studies have shown a lot of promise. Now, what's next? So on the left is a baby connected to a vagus nerve stimulation system that we developed in my lab. Uh, my lab really has one of the only IRB-approved studies to do brain stimulation in neonates. So this is one of the youngest populations receiving brain stimulation. And we pair stimulation with uh, rehabilitation training on how to feed. 
So these babies uh, that are born premature with a hypoxic ischemic event really don't have the ability to feed. And they're stuck in the nursery, and they end up getting discharged six weeks later with a G-tube. It's really painful for everyone involved. So what we want to do is avoid a G-tube, accelerate learning, and enhance the learning of this behavior. It seems to work. So we pair stimulation with the bottle, feeding behavior with occupational therapy, and babies are discharged between 10 and 22 days rather than six weeks, and they avoid G-tubes. So this is really cool stuff. We're developing a smart stimulation baby bottle in my lab that'll be a take-home uh, neurorehabilitation tool. Uh, we're developing Parkinson's and combined auricular vagus TDCS meditation paradigms, which will be neat. And there's a really interesting and really exciting take-home uh, digital therapeutic um, that's coming out uh, somewhat soon. Um, and it's made by a company called Equility that I work for um, briefly as a consultant, and they really are taking the next step of creating non-pharmacological mobile health systems. And you can actually stimulate your regular branch of the vagus nerve anywhere, anytime, pair it with a smartphone, and do combined CBT plus auricular vagus nerve stimulation to treat major depressive disorder. I think this is amazing. This is a, a really great, smart transition of you know, the entire body of our literature and research, and I think this is going to be a hit. Now, before we end here, I want to give a sneak preview of some of the work that my lab also does. It, we do e-meditation. So e-meditation is using TDCS, or transcranial direct current stimulation to uh, give a small nudge to the brain to assist you uh, in meditating. We've been demoing it upstairs. Our group was the first to publish on this in 2016. We've been working on it for five years, and uh, we think it's really going to help uh, individuals in the health and wellness domain at home uh, receive brain stimulation in a really safe, applied manner to assist in their meditation practice. Now, this was featured in the New Scientist recently in an article called Supercharge Your Zen. If you're interested, uh, you can check it out. I think it's a great read. It's just a couple pages. Um, and I wanted to update everybody on what's next in the e-meditation pipeline. So we have all of these really great Vegas findings, and they're all really in large-scale randomized controlled trials that won't be out for a couple years, but e-meditation really is now. And we have a couple events. There's 40 people in Lowell, Vermont right now at an e-meditation retreat, receiving brain stimulation to augment a five-day meditation retreat. Uh, we'll also be doing one here in the Bay Area, SF Dharma Collective, coming up soon, uh, the dates to be announced. We also have four more studies to be done in Milan and Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, we'll be launching a consumer product soon um, when we raise enough funding. So um, this is what it looks like. It's been demoed upstairs. If you've tried it, some people have tried it yesterday. Um, I think it's awesome. These are the really cool ways that you can transition awesome findings from the lab in a scientific method approach based to then commercialized technology that that's really works. And so this is some of the stuff that I'm really excited about. And lastly, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Helen Mayberg, said at a talk that science is like a symphony, and sometimes you're lucky enough to be the conductor. And in these studies, I'm not the only guy doing this. This is a list of 72 people that have helped in four studies that were talked about today. And I've been lucky enough to be the conductor, but it couldn't have been done without every one of these people here. And so if there's any junior people out there that think that you could do it yourself, you can't. You have to lean on everybody else for support. There's people here that or uh, go from ordering things all the way up to sleeping in the nursery overnight to help stimulate babies. And so these are really the shining stars and we're just really the translators of all of this science. So uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for, for this opportunity. And if you guys want, need help with any stimulation advice, we offer brain stimulation training in Charleston, South Carolina, twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring. You could look it up online. Uh, we also do uh, e-meditation events around the world. If you want, you can sign up. Uh, and that's about it. So thank you. <laughs>